so this is the last problem set, right? Uh, okay, I've been sending out some messages, make sure you get them about the, the lab, right? Uh, a number of you have already submitted. If you want it back to do something, you can always take it back, right? <laughs> you can always revise it. Okay. Uh, the lab, fortunately, the lab's not doesn't seem too bad, right? That's good. It's, appro it's appropriate for the end of the quarter. <coughs> okay. So the first one here is uh, four five one uh, circular membrane. We were given the radius the mass per unit area we're given and it's stretched to this tension per unit length. That's the relevant quantity for a membrane, right? Not the tension because that actually is not directly meaningful here. It's the tension per unit length as we discussed. It's in the fundamental mode, uh, certain blah blah blah. What is the frequency? What is the volume? Okay. So here's what we're given. This is the radius, remember? Mass per unit area, tension per unit length, and this is the peak ampli maximum amplitude of the fundamental. This and this is the symmetric, the the um, that's mutually symmetric mode, the first mode. So the displacement is given by a Bessel function here. There's no theta dependence. These are the the m equals zero modes. And we're looking at the fundamental here, K0. And remember, it, it's specified by the boundary condition here. It's what singles makes it a unique value. We have to have this going to 0 at R is equal to A. So this is the picture you want to always have in mind here. Uh, I'll do it of X. This is a situation looks like this, etc. This is 1. This is the first 0 of J0 called little j of 0, 1. Here's this value is going to be the second, and etc. So the fundamental here, th the boundary will be here, and it'll be going like this. This is R, so it's as mutually symmetric. So the frequency is going to be specified. We have to have K1 at A. This is what specifies K1. It's the fact that at K1 times A is equal to little j 0, 1, whatever, whatever that is. And it, it's this to, a num to four figures. It's 2.405. So this is going to specify K, which specifies the, fre the angular frequency. And from that, we get the actual frequency. So you go through this a lot, this process here. We know all these numbers, we can evaluate. Well, we don't know this number, but it's the square root, the speed of waves on the membrane is the square root of the tension per unit length divided by the mass per unit area. So I'm all in CGS units here. That's why I'm not put, putting the units in here. It's all CGS, so it's got to end up in hertz. And then I recognize it's a lot of hertz, so I'm going to, I'm going to go to kilohertz. So that's the frequency of the fundamental. Uh, we derive this in, in lecture, the average displacement here of the membrane. If you average over the area, it's going like this, and you, you average, do the complete average there. It's given by this. It's a fraction of the peak amplitude at the center, the origin, and it's this fraction. So we're, we're given this value, so we can calculate that. This is the average displacement. And from one of the things we can get from the average displacement that is sometimes important, it's especially important for, for sources. This is a receiver here. But we can find the maximum volume displaced by the membrane here, right? Because it's going to be, we can, it, it, there's an equivalent cylinder. So we have this membrane here. It's fixed. It's doing something like this. This is, this, is, this is a vessel function, right? There's going to be a cylinder here where, and this says, this is the axis of symmetry, okay? There'll be a cylinder here that has the same volume as that, and um, it'll have a certain height here, and that height is 
precisely the average value. If you think about it, you'll realize that it's precisely the va average value here. So this is our peak value here, and what we're calling A1. What we've we solve for here, this, this, what you want to put here is the average value over the surface, which is point, in this case, is 0 0.432 times A1. So the volume of the cylinder will be the same as the actual volume here and for sources that's important because as we'll see next quarter at long wavelengths long compared to the radius all that's important is the volume change of the source as, as we'll see um, so the volume change here I can get it once we know this height the average height just multiplying by the cross-sectional area and we get we get this Okay, any questions about that one? The next one here is 453. So again, we have a steel membrane of certain radius, certain thickness, certain tension pre -line. So we're given all this typical information for a membrane. Okay. Oh, we're not given the mass per unit area of the membrane, are we? So how do we get that? Well, we know the density, it's steel. So it's a typical density of steel here. So we, that's the mass per unit volume. So what we need to do, here's our, here's our membrane here, and I'm expanding this. This is much, this is not to scale, right? This is much thinner here than it is than, than the radius here. We know the density of the material. It's going to be just the density of, um, of steel. To get the mass per unit area, we have to integrate this over this thickness here. But because it's uniform, we just multiply by the thickness. Uh, or the width, sometimes I think I may have called this W. Yeah. And you're led to do this. You can be led to do this by purely dimensional reasons, you know. We've got to get the mass per unit area, right? So we need to multiply by a length here to get the right units. But um, that's what we're doing. You want to think of it, I think, as integrating the density over this dimension. Because all we care about, all that's relevant here is the mass per unit area. So we're given the width, we just multiply the two, and that's going to be the mass per unit area. Okay. Um, again, we're looking at, I think this whole problem set here is symmetric, the J0 modes. I think the whole problem set is that. Did we do some last, last problem set for the, the non-M equals zero modes where you have an angu angular dependence? Well, that's not good. <laughs> that's, that's my fault. We should do something, some kind of problem. <coughs> well, problem for M does not equal zero modes. Okay. All right, so getting back to this problem. Uh, four, five, three. Oh, so what's the frequency of the second overtone? What goes into your, when somebody tells you second overtone, what, what should you immediately think? Assuming you're not a musician or a musical acoustician, you want to convert that to normal physics language. The second overtone, right, the first overtone is the second mode. So this is just language, is natural. there's a reason why it's developed, but it, I know it, it seems confusing, but I recommend you just get rid of the word. When you encounter overtone, remove the word appropriately, right? So the second radially symmetric overtone is gonna be the third radially symmetric mode. So it's gonna look like this. 
Remember the first one has no interior nodes, right? This is the n equals zero. The, they're all m equals zero. Excuse me. This is, you know, n equals one. The next mode, you can think of it like this, is going to have a um, a, a, a circular node right here. And again, it all comes back to this. The next node corresponds to the boundary, the rim being here. Okay, so we get this node somewhere in here, this nodal circle. And the one we care about, the second overtone, is the third mode. So it's going to have it looks something like this. Okay, so these are always 180 degrees out of phase, and similarly here. So this has two nodal circles. Um, and we want to find, oh, first of all, what is the frequency? Let's find the frequency. Uh, again, the frequency is specified by the fact that the boundary will lie here. Okay, now that's an equivalent way of looking at it. You might imagine here that the boundary, oh, the boundary is fixed here, but we then just compress or extend this. We've got to have it. This has to correspond to A because we have to have this mode, the third mode. It's got two radial, it has two circu circular nodes here. The boundary has to be there, and that's going to specify the frequency in the same way, we, same way as we did before. K3A has to be that, that the value of this is zero right here. And what's that's something we look up. And here it is. It looks like it's 8.65. So from this, just like before, we can find the frequency, right? Omega is equal to CK. F is omega divided by 2 pi. Same idea that we go through a lot. Because usually we're interested in frequencies in hertz. So now we know everything here. We get C as the square root of the tension per unit length divided by the mass per unit area. We know those quantities. We look this up, the 8.65. That's this right here. And we get a frequency, and it happens to be 11.1 .1 kilohertz. So that's the frequency of this mode right here. Uh, part B. Uh, okay, good. I'm glad we're going to do this because I mentioned a couple times in lecture. What are the... Can we determine these radii here? Or radiuses, people say now. This is going to have a certain radius and this has a certain radius. This is the, the radius of the nodal circles. Yeah, we can do... We should be able to, right? And how do we do it? Well, remember here, we have the third mode. So it's going to be proportional to Z, J0 of K3 times R. And we have to have, this has to be 0 when R is equal to A. So K3A has to be, as I mentioned before, has to be this J03 here, which is 8.65. Imagine here, starting from a small r, starting from 0 if you like, for which you get the Bessel function will have value 1. Start increasing r slowly, okay, in your head. What's going to happen as you increase this? Eventually, you're going to hit a radius. Remember here, K3. Eventually, what happens is, eventually you're going to hit a radius here where you hit this value. Because the reason is, I know that when I get all the way to A here, I'm going to be at this point right here, right? That's when R is equal to A. So down in here, as I'm increasing R, equivalently R, I have it at the dimensionless variable X here, but it doesn't matter. I'm increasing R here. I'm going to hit a point where K3 times R1, that's the radius of the first nodal circle there, equals J0 of 1. And now I can solve. I can solve for R1 here because we know what K3 is from up here. So when we do that, 
we just get this. And you do the same process for the next one. As you keep increasing R, now eventually you're going to hit a point, you're going to hit this point right here. And that's going to be where K3R2 is equal to J02. We know K3, again, we've found K3. Here it is. That'll allow us to determine it. Finally, when you get to A, we have R1, R2. Finally, when you get to the rim, now you're going to be at J, it'll be equal to J03. So it's a simple process. It takes a little bit of thought. You know, I always have to stop and think about it a little bit, but it's, but it's simple. And it's very useful because very often acousticians are, when they're dealing with some uh, acoustic field, especially standing wave field, you, you usually want to know where the nodes are. It gives you a feeling for what's going on. So we can solve for them here. Uh, there's a part C here, which is when the membrane is vibrating at the above the displacement. Okay, uh, we derive this exact expression for the, as mutually symmetric modes, we found exactly what the average displacement is. You have to integrate J0, but we're able to do that because of a property of, one of the many properties of Bessel functions, and it ends up involving J1, you may remember that. So we have this expression here, and what we need to do is really, I think, just evaluate it um, but it's more interesting than you might think, okay? So let's go along here. We're evaluating it. This is a, this is a three. That's not very good. Okay, because we're doing this for the third mode. So we need to evaluate this J1 of little j03. Okay. It's not going to be zero. Remember, this J03 refers to the roots of J0, not the roots of J1. In fact, it's going to be close to an antinode. And that becomes, as you get away from the origin here, that becomes um, exact, more and more precise because of the asymptotic nature of Bessel functions. Okay, so if you go to the back of the book, there's table, there, there are actually tables there's a lot of Bessel function information in the back of the book along with other special functions of mathematical physics. And you'll find that there actually are tables of, of Bessel. Of this, this is tabulated at increments, right? The problem is, and it's a good thing that it happened here, actually, as I'll explain, is when you try to evaluate this at 8.65, the, the tables don't go that far. So what do you do? Well, I can tell you what you do. You get on the internet, right? And you're going to find you're going to find Bessel functions tabulated, or you're going to find a graph you can click on, and I don't know, right? But it's it's often better for analytical purposes to um, to realize here. that we're kind of pretty far out there. This is on the order of 10. We can use an asymptotic expression. I talked a little bit about this before. If you look in the back of the book, when x is significantly greater than 1, okay, now what do I mean by significant? Nobody can answer that question. It's how precise you want to be. You have to answer that question yourself. Okay, but you'll find in this case, I think it's a, a very good approximation. We'll see some evidence of that in a moment. You'll find this in the back on page 512. This is an asymptotic expression for J0 of 1. It's, it's valid out here, and the farther you get away, the more, more accurate it's going to be. You see how it's a damped sinusoid? It's damped by 1 over the square root of x. We talked about that before. And it's a damped sinusoid. And there is a phase here you have to be careful of. So we can just, we can use this, okay? Now you may wonder, well, how accurate is that? Well. My experience tells me it's going to be really accurate. Right? And if, you, if, you, um, if you're doing this for research and you want to be really careful and you're concerned, you can, you can find, like I said, you can find <coughs> the precise value of J1 out here. And I bet money in this case it's going to be really close. And the reason I'm saying that is, look at is something peculiar happens. It seems peculiar here. Look what we, when we evaluate 
this right here. We evaluate, we bring this to 3 quarters pi, we put our x in here. When you compute this number, you find to four figures, 0.9999. That's pretty suspicious, right? <laughs> why, why is it so close to 1? Well, it's an asymptotic property of the Bessel functions that once you get sufficiently far away, I, I so, I'm sorry to use words like that, but you know, it's all, a, again, how far you have to go depends upon the accuracy you desire. It's, what, it's what's important to you, okay? But as you get farther and farther away, what happens is you find that um, J1, see this is evaluated at a zero of J2. They become, um, the nodes and anti-nodes occur at the same point. A node of J0 is an anti-node of J1. And that's what we're seeing here. Because this is really close to, uh, oh I'm sorry, the argument here, the, the cosine of this turns out to be very close to 1. I said the, I, I meant, that's what I meant when I was before. Okay, this is accurate. So this fact right here, this tells me, and, and it should indicate to you too, that uh, I know it's, it's not obvious, but the fact that we're getting an anti-node here is means we're, we're, we're well in the re regime where it's a really good approximation to use the asymptote, to use this, to use this approximation. And this is, these are elementary functions, right? Yeah, okay. So anyway, we get a value. Uh, get the value. But the interesting thing here is the use of this asymptotic approximation. Okay, any questions about this yes. one? Yeah? Well, that's for a large argument, for a small argument, that's the expansion term for page 511, right? Yeah, so there are approximations for a large argument. We call them asymptotic approximations usually. And then there's small argument approximations. We're going to do a problem that involves that too. So they're, they're separate, right? right? They're different. So what was your question? Yeah, that's the map. map. Yeah, so this is the asymptotic. Yeah. And you can see it here. You see the damping. Bessel functions aren't this simple, okay? <laughs> If you're around here, there's, you know, they're their own functions, right? It's, they're they're not elementary functions, but they become simple. They become simple as you, simpler and simpler as you get out here. And this is the asymptotic approximation here for J1. And that should be on page 512, probably with the small argument one. And we'll do this. We'll do that. That'll come up uh, in a, later in the problem session today. The small argument. So this is things you want to get used to, right? Because these functions, you don't want to have to deal with Bessel functions exactly if you don't have to. Because they're, they can't be expressed in closed form in terms of elementary functions. So people often make approximations. Even when the approximations aren't all that good. It just makes life so much easier. And they just keep it in mind that they've made an approximation. Uh, any other questions or comments about this one? So 471. Ah, kettle drum problem. Okay, so we're given a kettle drum here. It's, uh, it's got a radius. Uh, we're given the mass per unit area, the tension per unit length. What is the fundamental frequency without the kettle? So this is just the pure membrane in the fundamental mode right here and we're given all this information uh, we'll use this in a minute this is the ratio of specific heats for air this is well known for air those of you who are taking modern physics have encountered this right because uh, this is famous because this is where quantum mechanics comes out well let me, I don't, I don't want to get into it but anyway uh, this is for air. The textbook really doesn't tell you that, but this is a well known. We're gonna don't worry about this now. We're gonna talk more about it next when we get involved in sound and air. We'll, we'll confront this. Okay, just use it right now. So, what are the speed of waves on the membrane? Well, it's just the tension per unit length divided by the mass per unit area. Take the square root. Everything's in SI units. Clearly, that's interesting. Yeah, they designed this 100 meters per second. Seems fast, doesn't it? 100 meters per second. So somebody hits a timpani, 
and there's a, there's a wave on there. And the speed of that wave, if there were no boundaries, okay, we, right? <laughs> because it's complicated when we get the modes there. But if you imagine there's no boundaries, the wave is moving, at, and I think that's probably typical, surprisingly fast. We hit that before with strings. We hit um, speeds of, in, in the experiment we did, right? What were the speed of the waves in the string typically? It's like 50 to 60, I think. Meters per second, right? Second. Yeah, I, I'm, I was surprised at that. I don't know, it just seems fast. It seems pretty impressive. <laughs> uh, anyway, so we got this. Uh, the frequency, that we've been through this enough times, you can look back. This, I'm just going to use the expression here. Remember, this is J01. So we get this from the discretization of K. We've done it several times, just today. So 153 hertz. All right, that's the frequency. That's just for the bare membrane. What happens when we put a volume? So here's the membrane. And now we're going to have what we call an enclosure here. Okay, this is rigid. Well, now, and we're making the, uh, it's a very good approximation here. Um, uh, maybe it's not a great approximation. Uh, the speed of waves is 100 meters per second. The speed of sound is about 343 meters per second. So it's not a great approximation. But you want to make it because when the wavelength of sound is large compared to the wavelength here, we have essentially the compressions and expansions in here are essentially uniform, which allows us to calculate easily calculate what's going on. Without that, it'll be, it'll be more, more complicated, a lot more complicated. So we're going to make that approximation. I didn't notice this, but it's, um, yeah, it's not a great approximation, looks like. Well, we did the theory for this, for the assuming the uniform compressions and expansions, because the wavelength of sound is big. We, I talked about that, right? Um, and what we found was, what's going to be important is, of course, the volume. Here's the volume. Remember, it's half a sphere. So that's why the one half is there. So we have a certain volume. And what ends up being important is this dimensionless parameter B here. All of these quantities. And we calculate it, and we happen to get here 5.2. I get 5.25, approximately. This is a dimensionless quantity that characterizes the enclosure in regard to the acoustic, to the, the vibrations here. It turns out to be the important quantity. And it comes from this transcendental equation here. You can look back. This is the transcendental equation. So this, we can't solve. This is our B value here. We can't solve this exactly, but you know how to do this on a calculator. Trial and error, right? It's the old F function. You can, um, actually you don't the way we would do this, uh, it would be a little bit different now. We don't, you don't need to graph it. You don't need to do a qualitative sketch. You would just use tables. Use tables in the back of the book and interpolate tables. Does everybody know how to inter interpolate tables? This is kind of an old thing that's been going on for hundreds of years. Usually I find that students know, well, know how to do that, but I'm afraid that it's because that you're you're military, most of you are, all of you are military officers and you have to deal with tables on a ship or whatever. Is that right? So I'm curious about the distance learning students. So anyway, if, if, if they know how to interpolate. When I was a student, you know, a long time ago, you know, think Cold War, um, we, we interpolated a lot, okay? And we were also using slide rules. So that, you know, things were different back then, right? <laughs> but um, so if the distance, you, so everyone here has no problem with interp ta table values and finding, approximating in linear interpolation. Is that right, JJ? They do it in Singapore? Okay. <laughs> all right. Uh, all right, so the distance learning students just, uh, if you have trouble, just, just let, let me know. Or you can look it up. I'm sure on the internet you can. They'll tell you how to do linear interpolation. It's, it's pretty simple. 
So anyway, we can use tables to linearly interpolate here. And in fact, I don't know if you remember, but in the lecture notes, I, and I got this from KFCS, I'm sure, they give us the value here, the solution, when it's five, when it's 5.00. And that ended up being 3.02. Right? Oh, by the way, I want to make sure one understands here. The point here, and it's similar to before with rods, with previous transcendental equations. Once we solve this for x, right, x is equal to ka, we can find the frequency. Once we know k, we can find the frequency. So that's, that's the point here. So anyway, uh, I went through this years ago, and um, what I find, this is a good place to to look in the table, to start right around here. And what you get from a linear interpolation, I get that it's to the nearest hundredth, I think, I get 3.05. We're pretty close to what the value is stated in the book, 3.02. But you can get this, you can do that, okay? And it's a good exercise, it's a good thing to do, I think. Once, at least once is good. Once we know that, we're essentially done. We can find the frequency. And it's bigger than the frequency here. And why is that? Why is the frequency greater here when we enclose this? Yeah. Well, you know, the, the membrane has stiffness. Right? The greater the stiffness, the greater the frequency. The membrane has stiffness. We've added another stiffness here. We're compressing and expanding that air. That air has stiffness. And it's raising the frequency. And if you made this volume smaller, it's going to be stiffer, isn't it? Yeah, and you'll, you'll see that this will be, be even bigger. This reflects, of course, the volume. When the volume becomes infinite, B goes to zero. Now we're back to the, the case without the enclosure, and we're, we're just going to get that frequency. OK, any questions or comments about that problem? Okay, the next one is 481. Oh. Oops. Okay, so this is the uh, equivalent to the water cooler when the water's shallow. Okay? Don't go out there and tell everybody that I said that, you know, you get Bessel functions in a water cooler. Because it's only when it's shallow, right? Because that's, that's where we get the wave equation. We're, we're talking about the standard wave equation here in two dimensions. And it only works for water waves when the depth is shallow compared to the wave, it turns out. Right? Okay. But you're still going to get um, those modes. And they're going, I thought about this. This came up a week or two ago or something. Um, the waveforms are still going to be Bessel functions. I think they have to be. It's that the frequencies will be modified because we don't have... We don't have the wave equation. How can that, what did I just say? No, I think I'm mixing it up with something else. Forget what I just said. I don't, I don't believe that. <laughs> you know, we don't have the wave equation. It's not going to be Bessel functions. Yeah? So when you say shallow compared to the wavelength, with the wavelength of the water forward, would you like, like uh, we're talking about a characteristic wave. It's hard to see the wavelengths here, right? Okay. Even in two, even for a rectangle. Remember we, we encountered that. But if you see something like this in the water cooler, okay, and here's the, and you see something that looks like this, okay, that's roughly a wavelength. I'm going to call that the characteristic distance here. So you want this distance to be large compared to this distance. Now in this case, it turns out, I've been through this, for water waves, it doesn't have to be that much bigger. It, you, it um, very quickly, uh, I, I, I don't think I should get into it, I can't. I don't, I'm probably gonna make a mistake, I'm gonna have to publish a retraction. But, um, you just want to be aware. My, my recollection is it doesn't have to be, this depth doesn't have to be really small here compared to this characteristic wavelength here to get the wave equation. And it's all a matter of what kind of precision you want. Right? Okay. So uh, we, we talked about this in the previous problem set, right? Uh, oh, this is driven. 
So this is going to be driven by a sound wave, I guess, right? Is that right? Well, it's driven by uniform pressure. We can take that to be a sound wave. If you like. And if you're worried about it, take it to be normal coming in this way. Now, this is for the membrane. Uh, sound waves will, will drive, interact with surface waves. Right? That's, people in the Navy know that, but we don't want to get into it. But just think of this as a member, I guess think of this as a free membrane, which is conceivable, and it's driven by this sound wave. It has pressure amplitude P. Now, again, I want to make sure everyone understands here, this, we're driving at any frequency here. I think it's, we're given actually a specific value. Is that right? Is this the 500 hertz problem? No. Okay, so because it's driven, we can drive it at any frequency, and it's going to respond in the steady state at that frequency. These modes come about because that's where it's going to resonate, right? And the resonant modes here, what's different about them is they correspond to a different boundary condition. Instead of being fixed, it's going to come in with zero slope. That's the, bound, that's the membrane analog of a string. It's a free boundary. It has zero slope. So here this, we have the same wave equation as we do when, regardless of the boundary condition. We know that the, the resonant as musically symmetric modes... Oh, incidentally, um, let me remind you, when we dr drive with a uniform pressure, we can't support any, as, any modes that have an azimuthal dependence. Remember we talked about this yesterday? So I make a statement about this here. So for example, if you have this, the M equals 1 mode, this is M equals 1, N equals, uh-oh, 0. Do we start, how do you start counting here? M is equal to 0, N is equal to 1. This is M is equal to 1. I know that. <laughs> what is this the, do we start, the, I've forgotten. This is always, yeah, it's always, okay. You have to be careful with um, the counting on vessel functions. Sometimes it, it can be a little tricky. So if I'm driving this with this uniform, I think, hopefully you can see, we talked about this yesterday, this mode is going like this, you know, it's, it's going like that. So we could, for example, like I said, we, we could be pumping energy into to this, I have the right phasing where we're pumping here, but it's going to be coming out here. We can't get any net energy in because of this is anti-symmetric here. And I think the best way to look at it is think of a, is a, of a string, right? And you're, dry, I don't know, maybe it's essentially this, maybe that doesn't help. But anyway, you can't, uh, so we're, we're just going to be able to excite, in this case, the azimuthally symmetric modes. So this is the problem, we, this problem we did in the past. We want to have zero slope at the boundary. So our solution here, our derivative with respect to R, evaluated at KNA has to be zero. So this is what specifies the frequencies here. It's KA equaling, equaling an anti-node, not a node. So do I still have, oh good, still have it here. So now, it's these values, and you have to be... Uh, here's sometimes the counting, I always have trouble with this, because this is an anti-node too, okay? So you just have to be careful if that's if, with the subscript, if, if you're counting there. Always be aware that when things happen at the origin here, you, you want to be a little bit careful. That that's always goes off in my head when I, when I encounter this. Okay, so the fact that now these Ka has to be our, our fundamental, our fundamental can't be, this, this does have zero slope, but what frequency is, does it correspond to? It's, it's zero frequency, so we rule that out. Okay, so we're interested, this is going to be the first, this is going to be, this is J0 prime Either one or two. Can somebody help me out? In the book, it's identified as J11, 1.84. J11? Oh, oh, okay. I, I can tell you, I think I know what's happening here. Yeah, it's a prime. It's 
You may have trouble finding a J01 prime, and there's a reason for that that we're going to hit right here. But can you find out? I just don't know what they, how they start the counting here. They could call this J01 prime because it has zero slope. I always have trouble with this. We call that J0. This one? No, no, no. The, the R is equal to zero. X is equal to Okay. Zero. So we got this then, right? Yeah, I was, I was worried about that. Yeah, okay. Now, the reason this, um, sometimes you don't see these tabulated is, I don't think we encountered this in lecture. This comes from a recursion relationship for the derivatives of the Bessel function. It's a special case, but it holds for, um, a, I think a little bit more complicated expression holds for, uh, it's a relationship giving you the derivative of Bessel function in terms of other Bessel functions. So you can think of it as like, you know, the derivative of the sine is a cosine, like I was telling you before. Um, it's just more complicated here. But if you look on this famous page 512, you'll find that this is an exact identity. So what that means is, what we're interested in right here is the zeros of the derivative of J0. Okay, these little J prime, we're interest, that's what we're interested in this problem because we have a free boundary condition. They're going to be exactly the same as the zeros of J1. They'll be exactly the same. Here, there's a precise statement. That's true, and that's exact. Anyway, however you want to look at it, we end up getting the spectrum here. Once we know these numbers, however we get them, um, right here, this is the formula that gives us the frequencies of the azimuthally symmetric modes. Okay, any questions or comments about that one? Okay, the last one here. Sun's coming out. Is 492. So we have a condenser microphone or capacitive microphone. We described this in class, in lecture. Uh, this is a sheet of aluminum. We're given the diameter, a little tiny thickness, which is typical. It's, it's, uh, oh, here. You know, you, I don't know why they put all those zeros. And you even really shouldn't do this. Just go to the appropriate unit. It's microns, okay? Millions of a meter. That's what's appropriate here. This is this tiny thickness. And it, has, it just has to be that way because to get the sensitivity to pick up on the sound. The sound amplitudes, as, as, we're gonna, as I think I might have told you, are remarkably small. So to pick up on the sound, you have to have thicknesses like this. It has to be really thin. Now this, is, this problem is interesting for several reasons. One of them is they start talking about the maximum, uh, they say uh, it may be stretched to a maximum tensile strength of so many Pascal. What does that mean? Okay, here's what it means. Look at a cross section of the material. Here's our material here. It has some width, W. Look at a little cross section of it. And imagine stretching it. And I didn't realize this until just before class. I think we need to imagine, actually, to be precise here, we need to stretch it in both directions equally, isotropically, independent of angle, okay? If you keep stretching it with a greater, if you apply a greater and greater force, greater and greater tension, eventually it's going to break, right? That's the maximum tensile strength. You take that force and divide it by the area. That's the maximum tensile strength in, in, in Pascal. So we want, we're told that this is operating at that point. So. That's the force per unit area, okay? Now the area is the cross, what's important here is the cross-sectional area. That's what's important. And I think you can buy that, right? Suppose I stretch this until it just, just breaks, right? And it, and it breaks it with a certain force. If I go in there now, go back and double the area, am I gonna get the same? No, it's gonna be doubled. It's gonna have that kind of scaling. 
right? So a lot of times things are simple like this when I talk about failure points. You know, you know pretty much how things are going to scale. So that's why we have, the, that's why it's divided by the area here. This, this value will work for any area. You just have to put it in. The next step here is to notice that the area is W times L, right? And now, what is F max divided by the length? That's the quantity that's relevant for the membrane. That's the force, the tension per unit length, right? So I'm going to replace that. We call, we've been calling that tau, right? I'm going to call it tau max because that's going to be the maximum value. So the point of all this exercise, I think this is interesting. I, I remember when I first saw it, I had to stop and think. Um, you know, they're being clever here, making you think to get, get what we need. What we need is tau, because that's our theory is in terms of tau. That's the important quantity for a membrane. So what it's going to be is, you can see here, the maximum value will be the stated maximum tensile strength, pressure, whatever, times the thickness W. And that gives us our force per unit length. This is the quantity we need. Um, again, we have to do what we did before. We're not told the mass per unit area, but it's the same as before, right? Just multiply by the width. And so now we can find the speed of waves. Here it is in this case. Uh, we can find the frequency of the fundamental just as we've done many times in this problem set, involving the J01, 2.405. There's no ambiguity here, right? So I just want to warn you when you look at this Bessel function thing, what does J1 look like? It's going to look something like this, right? It looks something comes over here like this. So what's J little you know, it has a zero here. So are you going to count that or are you not going to count it? I think people, acousticians would just as well not count it. It's like you'd like to start counting from here because this doesn't correspond to a mode. But other people, who, and Bessel functions occur in a lot of other situations, I think they, they start numbering from here. So just, just a little warning. I always have to, like I said, I always have to think this. Whenever I get into Bessel function roots, I got to know how they're doing the counting, you know? <coughs> Um, okay, I triggered because I saw this right. <laughs> All right. So anyway, what we find here is about seven kilohertz. So is this microphone going to go audio range? Is it? I told you most mic t microphones typically, audio microphones go to 20 kilohertz, right? No, you know we can't. Um, I mean, you can, but you're going to hit trouble. It's, it's the sensitivity. You know, is not going to. Well, we'll talk more about this next quarter. But um, this is where it's going to resonate. So you can still use the microphone. It can still be pretty accurate beyond there because the damping's been designed, right, to beat that resonant peak down so that it's still flat. Remember we talked about that yesterday? So these are useful things. So it'll, it'll operate somewhere. It'll be accurate if you want to determine, use the microphone to determine ac acoustic pressure, for example, from the voltage that you get from it. It'll be fairly accurate for some, a little bit beyond this. Uh, okay, so what's the displacement amp amplitude at its center when we have a 500 hertz wave? Okay, so it's going to reach a steady state. We solved that problem yesterday, and here's the solution. This is the response. I should have put a T here. Here's, it's best just to look at this. Here's the response, the displacement, as a function of distance from the origin and time. It's settled into the frequency of the, of the drive. Um, that's what it is. Now, wh the information we're given here is we know the displacement, the psi at zero. So I evaluate J0 at zero. What's J0 at zero? One, right? <coughs> And I get this, okay. Uh, what is Ka here? What's our Ka number, this dimensionless number? Well, again, you, may, you need to think, maybe, I want to make sure you understand this. The frequency is specified. It's 500 hertz. Omega equals Ck, so that's going to specify a certain K. So we've met the boundary condition. You, know, you have to, 
think differently on normal modes and when it's driven. They're, they're different perspectives. They're related. But uh, we can drive this thing at any frequency we want. We're gonna, and we're going to get a response. So we can find the Ka number here. And it's equal to 1.173. Now that probably doesn't look small to you, right? But um, once we get into next quarter, this is going to look small to you. And I can prove to you, right, you know, what do I mean by small? What am I talking about? Well, you're going to see on the next page, okay? We need to find J, we need to find J0 to do this problem. We need to find J0 of 0.173, right? You can interpolate it, but that's boring. I mean, you want to do it once. Don't get me wrong. You should do it, okay? <laughs> Once every 10 years, or I don't know, whatever. You want to, you know, you should do it. But previous problem. But we can make an approximation here, a small argument approximation. So I guess I didn't put the page. Is it also on that page number 512? Small argument? 511. 511? Oh, okay. All right, so here's J0. Does this surprise anybody here? Look at this. What is this? It's a parab what kind of parabola is it? Inverted parabola? It's not surprising at all, is it, that we can, f we, we can fit a parabola here. And this is the fit. This is what it is. There are higher order terms here which we're neglecting because when x is small, they become much smaller than this value. This is already small compared to 1. The next term, the quartic term, is going to be even much smaller. We neglect it in this approximation. So it's an in, it's an in, in our approximation, it's an inverted parabola. You may wonder, but this is not much less than 1. How can we get away with it? Well, look at this. Plug it in. I, I plugged this expression in. And here's what we get. If you just look at the previous page, this is what we're going to get. Now, um, 0.173, what's important is not the 0.173 by itself, but the square of point. What's that? It's going to be much smaller. Right? And we also have this dividing by a factor of 4. This is going to be pretty small. That tells you right away that we're, we have a, a pretty good approximation here. That's a very strong indication. If you want to get any more precise, you have to do a lot more work. But the fact that this is tiny tells me that we're, this is small here, okay, unless we're doing extremely precise work. Now, we should simplify this. What's 1 over 1 minus a small quantity? 1 plus a small quantity. Oh, have we seen that before? We used it so much. We used it before in this class. It's a, you can think of it as a Taylor expansion or a binomial expansion, however you want to think of it. Uh, you can plug it on a calculator if you want. So this is tiny for us. So we're going to go ahead and make this approximation. And now, this is really nice. It analytically simplifies. We get rid of the ones right here. And this is our expression. And look at this. The k squared cancels the k squared. Remember the significance of that? This is flat. The micro we proved that yesterday. The microphone is flat. It's giving us, for, for all sound waves of the same pressure amplitude, it's giving us the same voltage. It's going to give us the same voltage, okay, which is a very desirable property. It doesn't depend upon frequency, just upon the amp pressure amplitude. So we can calculate this, and we get this number here. Now we're told to find the average. So this is the peak value, remember? And then next we're, fi we're finding the average value here. Right? We derived this yesterday, or I don't know when, in the past. This is the average displacement over the, mic over the membrane. Um, oh, what's, what, have I, what have I done going from here to here? I've used the small Ka approximation for J0. There's the inverted parabola. What about this? Okay, J2. J2 comes in like this. You can look that up. It's going to be on one of those pages, 512, or what's well, going to be on some in appendix somewhere. I made this approximation. Now, the next step, this may disappoint you. This is a small quantity here, Ka squared. This is 1. To lowest order in Ka, which is Ka squared, what am I, what am I going to do? How do I approximate this? I kill this term. Sorry. But we're doing this all to Ka squared. Our whole analysis here 
the small quantity, Ka squared. I really have to kill this term. You might say, well, let's include it just to be a little bit more accurate. No, we've made that approximation. We've already gone to this quadratic order. So to be consistent, we really have to kill this. Alex is the only one who's understanding what I'm saying right now. But, <laughs> but, but you know, I, it's just good for you to encounter this. And you'll eventually, this is perturbation theory. And it always causes students trouble. I, it took me a long time to get it. Okay, but we're doing a second order analysis here. We're accurate to k-squared. We actually, it's not that we choose to, rec to neglect this compared to one. We really have to. We'd be fooling ourselves if we kept it. Okay, so now you work all this out and you get this and then you recognize that miraculously the average value is half the peak value. So do you think that's a coincidence? That's a little too simple, isn't it? Okay, so when I saw, I don't, it wasn't until, I don't know why, I should have picked up on this years ago, but if you take a parabola, an inverted parabola, this is now a parabola, because we in our approximation, right? This is a parabola. And you find what, how high you have to go here so that you have the same volume. So that the volume of this is the same as the volume inside, the, inside there for a parabola of revolution. It's one half. It's a property of a parabola. Parabolas have a lot of properties. I know it doesn't seem right, but it's, I checked it. I calculated it. I had to do it. So what we're seeing here is just this property of parabolas. Now I made a comment there. Okay, uh, sorry we went way over, but last meeting. All right, anybody have any questions or comments? Lab, uh, lab reports are due tomorrow for you guys. They're due next Monday for the DL students. <laughs>